For many people, the history of Canada is thought of as the War of 1812, Confederation in 1867, the 1870 and 1885 rebellions, World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, peacekeeping, the FLQ crisis, the Constitution of 1982, and then what we enjoy as modern-day Canada. Now, that really is a simplified take, but it is part of the reason the Heritage Minutes became so popular. They introduced parts of Canadian history into our collective consciousness that weren't necessarily taught to us in school. Now, even outside of those moments, there is so much about Canadian history to look at. Not just the history of the nation of Canada, but Indigenous history in what would become Canada. The colonial history of both the French and the British events of not just national but international importance, Canadian discoveries and inventions, and so much more. This podcast aims to look at some of these stories of Canadian history. Now, yes, some of these may be somewhat well-known, but the story of the events themselves isn't the only story to be told. We will look at the many distinct parts of Canadian history, telling vibrant tales that many people don't know, stories of heroism, adventure, exploration, intrigue, mystery and much more. In our first set of episodes, we will explore how the first American offensive of the Revolutionary War shaped how Canada would grow beside the United States, and how the planning of the offensive had a direct role in the creation of two nations. Our first series, the 1775 Invasion of Quebec. At the outset of the American Revolutionary War, there were questions in both the 13 U.S. colonies, that would become the states, as well as in London, as to whether the British colony of Quebec would join the rebellion. After all, Quebec had only been a British colony since the end of the Seven Years' War in 1763. The former French colony of Quebec found itself closely tied to the Americans, including an anti-British sentiment. However, there were some concessions made to Quebec by the British government to keep them pacified. The first of these, the Quebec Act, noted by American colonists as one of the intolerable acts that helped lead to the American Revolution. The act included a number of items that directly countered the desires of the colonists of the 13 colonies. The territory of Quebec was expanded, including much of what is now Ontario, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. It also removed any reference to Protestantism from the Oath of Allegiance and guaranteed the free practice of Catholicism. It also restored the use of French civil law for matters of private law while putting English common law in place for matters of public law, including criminal prosecution. While the act itself was intended to pacify the habitants of Quebec and keep them from joining the cause of revolution from their southern neighbors, it wasn't necessarily a universal success. Guy Carleton, the Governor General of Quebec at the time, wrote to British General Thomas Gage in February of 1775 that the Canadiens were overall happy with the act, but there were some provisos. Carleton wrote, I must not, however, conceal from Your Excellency that the gentry, well disposed and heartily desirous as they are to serve the Crown and to serve it with zeal when formed into regular corps, do not relish commanding a bare militia. They never were used to that service under the French government, and perhaps for good reasons, besides the sudden dismission of the Canadian regiment raised in 1764, without gratuity or recompense to officers who engaged in our service almost immediately after the session of the country. Of taking any notice of them since, though they all expected half pay, is still uppermost in their thoughts, and not likely to encourage their engaging a second time in the same way. As to the habitant or peasantry, ever since the civil authority has been introduced into the province, the government of it has hung so loose and retained so little power, they have in a manner emancipated themselves, and it will require time and discreet management, likewise, to recall them to their ancient habits of obedience and discipline. Considering all the new ideas they have been acquiring for these ten years past, can it be thought they will be pleased at being suddenly and without preparation embodied into a militia and marched from their families, lands, and habitations to remote provinces and all the horrors of war which they have already experienced? It would give appearance of truth to the language of our sons of sedition, at this very moment busily employed in stilling into their minds that the act was passed merely to serve the present purposes of government and in the full intention of ruling over them with all the despotism of their ancient masters. Now, Carleton had been the Governor-General of Quebec since 1768. 
and he came from a Protestant family in Ulster that had strong ties to the military. He had originally been commissioned as an ensign in 1742 and was a lieutenant by 1745. He fought in the War of the Austrian Succession, then served in North America under Major General James Wolfe. He would continue to serve through the Seven Years' War, suffering a head wound during the Battle of the Plains of Abraham. Many parts of the Quebec Act were passed based on the recommendations of Carleton, as he looked to ensure that the French traditions were respected while also ensuring rights of citizens as understood by the Kingdom of Great Britain. Given that he helped to author one of the intolerable acts, it can even be argued he had helped to put into place some of the grievances the Americans would use as their casus belli to start the war. Now, even before the letter from Carleton to Gage, overtures had been made by the Americans to get the residents of Quebec to join them. French Canadians were formally invited to a meeting of the First Continental Congress in a public letter written in 1774. The first letter, crafted by the Continental Congress, was written under the supervision of the delegates to the Congress from Pennsylvania. The letter pointed out the rights that Quebec did not have after 1763's Treaty of Paris that ended the Seven Years' War. The letter called the first grand right that of elected representation. The letter said, The first grand right is that of the people having a share in their own government by their representatives chosen by themselves and in consequence of being ruled by laws which they themselves approve, not by edicts of men over whom they have no control. This is a bulwark surrounding and defending their property, which by their honest cares and labors they have acquired so that no portions of it can legally be taken from them. But with their own full and free consent, when they give in their judgment, deem it just and necessary to give them for public service and precisely direct the easiest, cheapest and most equal methods in which they shall be collected. The influence of this right extends still farther. If money is wanted by rulers who have in any manner oppressed the people, they may retain it until their grievances are redressed and thus peaceably procure relief without trusting to despise petitions or disturbing the public tranquility. The letter then described the second great right, trial by jury. It says, This provides that neither life, liberty, nor property can be taken from the possessor until twelve of his unexceptionable countrymen and peers of his vicinage, who from that neighborhood may reasonably be supposed to be acquainted with his character and the characters of the witnesses upon a fair trial and full inquiry, face to face in open court before as many people as choose to attend, shall pass their sentence upon oath against him, a sentence that cannot injure him without injuring their own reputation and probably their interest also, as the question may turn on points that in some degree concern the general welfare, and if it does not, their verdict may form a precedent that, on a similar trial of their own, may militate against themselves. Other rights highlighted in the letter to the inhabitant were the right of habeas corpus, the right of holding lands by tenure of easy rents and not by services, and the right of a free press. These letters have been called by some, including historian Marcel Trudel, as a crash course on democratic government. Gustave Langteau states the letter introduced to Habitant the notion of political equality. The letter then called not for the Canadian to take up arms against the British, but to instead look to their options and situation, and to send a delegation to the Continental Congress in May of 1775. This first letter was printed in French and English and was sent to Canada for distribution. There, Carleton did his best to prevent its circulation. However, it still made its way around and was discussed in town meetings. Now, these meetings would ultimately be dominated by English-speaking Canadian and ended with no delegations being sent from Quebec to Philadelphia. In early 1775, the Continental Congress dispatched John Brown to Quebec to gather intelligence and to gauge sentiment about rebellion and also to stir up sentiments of rebellion. He found that the French-speaking population of Quebec was neutral at best to British rule, with many happy with it. The English speakers were also uneasy about adopting things like the export boycott of Congress, noting that the French would then gain access to the fur trade, which was a key economic player in the economy of Quebec at the time. Brown did note, though, a rather weak military presence in Quebec. This would set the stage for the events that would unfold over the next year. A second letter was drafted in May of 1775 by the Second Continental Congress. This letter, which has been primarily attributed to John Jay, likened the form of government in place in Quebec as tyranny, saying the form of government made the Canadian into slaves, 
The letter also warned the population of being forced to fight against France if they decided to join the war against the British on the side of the Americans. The letter also had a rather ominous warning, saying they did not want the Canadiens to reduce us the disagreeable necessity of treating you as enemies. This letter initially arrived in Montreal and was circulated in the province. The Canadian were little swayed by promise of English-style liberties when they had already enjoyed, thanks to the Quebec Act, many of the liberties that they had enjoyed prior to the loss of Quebec as a French colony and the Treaty of Paris. The letters did draw some support, though, as it did help to raise two regiments that would serve as part of the American Continental Army during the Revolutionary War. As the debate surrounding these letters continued in Quebec, the Americans started to take some military action, moving on to the offensive. The main thrust of their actions in the preliminary stages of the war would involve the northern borders of the colonies and would ultimately end with the invasion of Quebec. Now, this invasion would be the first major offensive taken by the Continental Army. The goals? To take the province of Quebec from the British and to gain the support of the habitants. The outcome of the invasion would go on to have long-lasting impacts, not only on the rest of the Revolutionary War, but on the very foundations on which the United States would be formed. The invasion of Quebec started with a battle in what is now upstate New York, the Battle of Ticonderoga. The fort itself now lies in Adirondack Park in New York, at the narrows of the south end of Lake Champlain. The fort had been constructed by Canadian military engineer Michel Chargier de Lobigny in 1757. The fort had fallen into disrepair after the Seven Years' War and was manned by just a token British force. However, it did remain as a vital link, especially for communications between Canada and New York. With just 48 men there, the detachment was surprised by the Green Mountain Boys, led by Ethan Allen and Colonel Benedict Arnold on May 10th of 1775. The armaments from Ticonderoga were then taken to Boston to be used to help break the siege of that city. Now, Allen was a divisive figure in the initial stages of the Revolutionary War. Shortly after the capture of Fort Ticonderoga, he would see the command of the Green Mountain Boys, which were now a part of the Continental Army, moved to Seth Warner. Arnold, as many now know as being synonymous with being a traitor, would have some of the seeds of his eventual change of sides planted over the course of the next year. Now, after seizing Ticonderoga, a small detachment of Americans then went to Fort Crown Point, where they overwhelmed the British who had staffed that fort with just nine men. With the Americans now controlling a vital position at the southern end of Lake Champlain, Carleton called for the reinforcement of Fort Saint-Jean at the northern end, along the shores of the Richelieu River. Troops for this came from Montreal, Trois-Rivières, and Quebec. After the capture of Ticonderoga, both Allen and Arnold proposed, independently of each other, an invasion of Quebec, with both figuring a force of roughly 1,200 men being sufficient. Congress at first was content with holding a defensive position, calling for Ticonderoga to be abandoned for the time being. Upon hearing that the British forces in Quebec were starting to fortify positions such as Fort St. John, they felt it might not be prudent, though, to remain on the defensive. Congress decided in June of 1775 that they would need to take a proactive step in the area, and called on General Philip Schuyler to investigate and potentially start an invasion. Now, because the invasion had originally been his idea, and he was passed over for command of it, Benedict Arnold went to Boston to meet with George Washington. There, he was able to convince Washington to send a supporting force to Quebec City under his command. Schuyler was an experienced general, having fought in the French and Indian War, which was what the North American theater of the Seven Years' War has come to be called. He was appointed as a major general of the Continental Army when he was given command of what was called the Northern Department and would also serve as part of the Continental Congress. While his military exploits were well known, he has also become known for his son-in-law, Alexander Hamilton, who has been touted by many as perhaps one of the most influential people in the formation of the United States. Knowing that an invasion was imminent, Carleton, in addition to sending more troops to Fort St. John's, ordered the construction of bateaux to use on Lake Champlain. These are flat-styled boats. He also started to raise militias to aid in the defense of Quebec and Montreal, although those efforts were nowhere near as successful as he would have liked. Carleton would lead the defense of Montreal himself and put Lieutenant Governor Hector Theophilus de Crame in charge of the defense of Quebec City. While the military preparations were underway, 
Both sides also negotiated with Indigenous leaders for support. Loyalist Guy Johnson was a British Indian agent, and he met with Huron and Iroquois leaders at Port Ontario. They promised they would keep supply lines open and to help the British with the annoyance of the enemy. Then traveling to Montreal, he met with around 1,500 Indigenous people and negotiated similar agreements. Most of those agreements were with Mohawk leaders, however, and other nations that were part of the Iroquois Confederacy opted to remain neutral. The Mohawk would remain in the Montreal area, but when it appeared uncertain if the Americans would even launch an invasion, many returned home. The Americans worked to keep the Six Nations out of the war. Missionary Samuel Kirkland met with Oneida and Tuscarora leaders, and while they formally remained neutral, some did express sympathy with the rebels. Further meetings, including some with Schuyler himself, explained that the Americans weren't looking to conquer any territory from the indigenous, but rather assert their rights and gain independence from the British. The chiefs stated they would remain neutral, with one reportedly saying it was a family affair and they will sit on the sidelines. They did, however, gain concessions from the Americans in exchange for their neutrality, such as addressing grievances about the encroachment of settlers on their lands. With the lines being drawn among the indigenous peoples, the Americans began their actual preparations for the invasion. The primary forces, led by Schuyler, would travel north up Lake Champlain and capture Montreal, then move on to Quebec. The force would comprise of men from New York, Connecticut, and New Hampshire. The Green Mountain Boys from the Vermont area, led by Seth Warner, were also part of the force. While Schuyler was meeting with the indigenous leaders, word came to the assembled troops left under the command of Richard Montgomery that the British were near finished their construction of the boats on Lake Champlain. With Schuyler away and lacking any orders about in advance, Montgomery opted to take the 1,200 men to ile aux noix on the Richelieu River. Schuyler later caught up with them on September 4th, and he sent a letter to James Livingston, a Canadian who is living in Quebec, to start raising a militia in the Montreal area that would fight with the Americans. From ile aux noix the Americans would capture Fort St. John's. The first attack would be repulsed after a brief skirmish. A force of Oneida arrived on the side of the Americans, and they intercepted a Mohawk war party that was en route to fight for the British. The party was convinced to return home and not provide any aid. Following that first skirmish, Schuyler would become too ill to continue to lead the force. He handed control over to Montgomery, then returned to Ticonderoga. Shortly after Schuyler's departure, another roughly 900 men arrived to assist the invasion force, and they commenced the invasion. The night of September 10th, Montgomery led a 1,000 men by boat, landing near the site of the initial skirmish. In the darkness, some of the men became separated from the others, and the groups mistook each other as the enemy. They would fall back to the boats, where Montgomery ordered them out again. This time, they met a few habitants and panicked, once again falling back, retreating to the boats. Then, with word the British warship Royal Savage was approaching, they fell back to ile noix almost leaving the command staff behind. Now, the Royal Savage was a schooner armed with eight four-pounders and four six-pounders. It would be a ship to be reckoned with if it had have encountered any of the boats being used by the Americans. On September 17th, another attempt was made from ile aux noix with the army disembarking from the boats south of St. John. A detachment was sent to block the road heading north to Montreal, and a flotilla of armed boats was put into place to engage the Royal Savage if it joined the battle. A wagon train of supplies intended for the fort was captured. A sortie from the British went to recapture those supplies, but they were forced back into the fort by the Americans. On the 18th, Montgomery ordered his men to entrench around the fort and set up a mortar battery that was able to reach into the fort. John Brown, under Montgomery's command, was sent to set up a position at La Prairie where a crossing of the St. Lawrence was possible en route to Montreal. Ethan Allen was sent to collect any of the Canadiens who were willing to fight with the Americans and then to watch the crossing at Longueuil. Allen would reach Longueuil on September 24th and decided to take it upon himself to launch an attack on Montreal. His actions would result in the Battle of Long Point. Carleton, hearing the Americans had landed on the northern shore of the river, raised the alarm. Under Captain John Campbell, 34 regulars from the 26th foot, 120 Canadian militiamen, 80 English militiamen, 20 Indian agents, and a number of indigenous men went out to meet the Americans. The battle lasted roughly 90 minutes, with Canadian recruited by the Americans 
fleeing instead of holding their positions. Vastly outnumbered, the American lines broke and Allen surrendered. He would spend the next year on British prison ships before being finally paroled in November of 1776. Now, Allen would go on to blame Brown for his failures, citing that Brown was supposed to reinforce him. Many historians, however, say that this was more of a case of Allen trying to shift the blame to someone else for his own failures. In fact, learning of Allen's capture from his home in Albany, Schuyler wrote, I am very apprehensive of disagreeable consequences arising from Mr. Allen's imprudence. I always dreaded his impatience and impudence. The failed attack by Allen allowed the British to muster around 1,200 men for the defense of Montreal. With a swelling of the ranks, Carleton had an advantage. He could have pressed by leading a sortie from Montreal to relieve the siege at Fort St. John. He didn't, however, and many of the men who had come to aid in the defense of the city headed home for harvest after weeks of waiting. For the Americans, they continued to build their siege works through swampy conditions. Montgomery described his army as a half-drowned rats crawling through a swamp with food and ammunition running out. Disease also wreaked havoc on the strength of his command, with more than 900 men having to go back to Ticonderoga due to illness. Reinforcements in the form of artillery would start to arrive for the Americans at Port St. John. The first was a large cannon called Old Sal that came up from Ticonderoga. It arrived on October 6th, and on the 7th, it began to fire on the fort. A second battery was then put in place on the eastern shore of the Richelieu, where it had a full view of the shipyard and the Royal Savage. The second battery would be finished on October 13th, began firing on the 14th, and by the 15th, the Royal Savage was no longer a factor in the battle. North of Fort St. John along the Richelieu was Fort Chambly, which was more of a storehouse for the British. A small force of Americans slipped up the river to this fort, and after two days of bombardment, it would surrender. According to author W.J. Wood in his book Battles of the Revolutionary War, the Americans also gained invaluable supplies, including six tons of gunpowder, 6,500 musket cartridges, 125 muskets, 80 barrels of flour, and 272 barrels of foodstuffs. The capture of Chambly also allowed for the Americans to put another battery in place to the northwest of Fort St. John. Those guns would be in place by the end of October. With Fort St. John now surrounded by batteries and under fire from all sides, Carleton was forced to act. He called for soldiers from Quebec, the Royal Highland emigrants, as well as the militia, to move along the Richelieu River while Carleton would cross at Longueuil and advance to the fort. The force coming from Quebec was under the command of Colonel Allen McLean, and he had around 600 men. Carleton was coming from Montreal with roughly 1,000 men. On October 30th, Carleton crossed the St. Lawrence, but his efforts were repulsed by Seth Warner and the Green Mountain Boys. McLean saw his militia leave him, with morale shattered after Carleton's loss at Longueuil, and he would have to fall back to Quebec. The American ranks would then be bolstered by the arrival of 500 more men under the command of Brigadier General David Wooster, and the situation became grim for the defenders in Port St. John. On November 1st, Montgomery sent a prisoner who had been captured at Longueuil just two days earlier into the fort under a flag of truce carrying a letter from the American general. In the letter, Montgomery pointed out that there was likely no more relief efforts coming after the failure of Carleton and McLean to lift the siege, He offered the commander of the fort, Major Charles Preston, a negotiation of terms of surrender. Preston counter-offered a four-day truce to see if there would be another attempt to relieve the siege, and if none came, then he would surrender the fort. This was rejected by Montgomery, and a second soldier who had been captured at Longueuil would go in, and he confirmed the dire situation the British found themselves in. The terms of surrender would be drawn up the next day, and on November 3rd, Preston and his men surrendered their weapons. In all, there were 536 British soldiers and officers, 79 Canadian volunteers, and 8 English volunteers. With the capture of Fort St. John, after a 45-day siege, the road was now open for Montgomery to march on Montreal. While the force commanded by Montgomery made its way to Montreal, what of the secondary force that was commanded by Benedict Arnold? How had they fared in their trip from Boston to Quebec? We'll take a look at that in our next episode of Canadian History with Stephen Wilson.